Shall we stand for the reading of the gospel? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Today's reading is taken from the Gospel of John, the first chapter. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him. He said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said to them, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. Now, it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at Simon and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Kephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, he decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the town of Andrew and Peter. Peter found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one about whom Moses wrote, and also the prophet, Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. The Gospel of the Lord. for inviting me today on this ecumenical Sunday to preach in this wonderful First Methodist Church. It was last June when I was at the ordination of several Methodist ministers, in fact, among whom was Trish, and I laid hands uh, in the name of the church on her and several others. But as I sat at the ceremony, I thought to myself, why is it that we are separated? Why is it when so many things are the same or nearly the same? We are divided. And I thought about what Jesus said that they all may be one, Father, as I am in you, you are in me. And I leave those words with you. They all may be one. When I'm called. 
calling you. <coughs> Will you answer? Those two little verses come from the Indian love poem. And that song was featured in the movie Rosemary. And the stars of that movie were Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald. And the movie, for those of you who are wondering, was first released to the public 1936. So I know that at least a large number of us weren't able to see it. <laughs> but in the movie and that Indian love poem, the legend is that a Native American maiden fell in love with a warrior of another tribe. And because they were opposing tribes, even though they were in love, they were never allowed to marry. <coughs> so the legend goes that the maiden would sing that song when I'm calling you down a ravine, down a mountainside near a lake in hopes that as she sang, the spirit so familiar to our Native American brothers and sisters would carry that song to wherever he was. He would hear it and respond back. She would call. He would answer. So what is it that Nelson Eddy and Jesus have in common? <coughs> Nelson Eddy called out a love song. God is answer. Jesus calls out to you and to me. And he's looking for We have two wonderful readings today in the scriptures. The reading from Samuel is about, oddly enough, Samuel. <coughs> Samuel is a young man. He obviously has been put in charge of taking care of Eli, who's having trouble seeing. He's an older man, in other words. And in the middle of the night, Eli hears the call. I'm sorry, Samuel hears the call. Samuel. He leaps up, figuring that Eli needs some help in the middle of the night. I can't imagine why. <laughs> but he dashes in and he says, here I am. And Eli says, for heaven's sake, go back to sleep. Leave me alone, I'm all right. And Eli hears that call a couple of more times. He does exactly the same thing. You can read it all right here in the scriptures. Won't be in those words, though. And on the third time around, when Eli is thinking to himself, this kid really is kind of dumb, doesn't get it. He begins to realize, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe somebody else is calling. Maybe God is calling him. So the third time around, he says to Samuel, Eli does, I'm okay, man. You know, leave me alone. Let me sleep. How about that? But the next time you hear the voice, why don't you say this? I'm here, Lord. Your servant is listening. And Samuel hears the voice again. 
and he does exactly what the Lord asked. The Lord came and revealed his presence to Samuel, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. And then the scriptures go on to say to us, Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him not permitting any word of his to be without effect. Samuel heard the word of God. He accepted the word of God. Your servant might say, the rest is biblical history. In the reading from John, we hear about another call. This time, John the baptizer says to two of his disciples, as Jesus is walking by, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two of them desert him immediately and go and follow Jesus. Now I'm sure that Jesus was probably walking along with some people with him, teaching, because he's always teaching. And he feels the presence of these two new fellows. And he turns to them and he says, what are you looking for? And they answer, Lord, where are you staying? Now do you think they were looking for an address? you have enough beds in the place for us? You got any bathrooms? No, they probably didn't ask, ask that question. But they wanted to know, according to what we would think anyway, where are you living, man? And Jesus says, very simple. And see. Now, one of the things we have to remember here is that this is from the Gospel of John. And John is forever teaching. He is the theologian among the evangelists. He is always pushing us to go a little further into our understanding of Jesus so that we might recognize who Jesus is. Is behold the Lamb of God. And so what does he do? What word does he use? Lord, where are you staying? What kind of a place you got, man? But that isn't why John used that word. He used that word, staying, because that same verb is used when John describes the relationship of Jesus with his Father. He says, Jesus abides with the Father. Jesus is staying with the Father. So what John is reminding us of is that the disciples were saying, where do you abide? You abide with the Father. The Father abides with Jesus. Jesus and the Spirit abide in the Father. The Father abides in the Spirit. And you 
say all that out of one word? <laughs> yeah. From John. Yes. Because John is again, as I said earlier, pushing us to understand the significance of what it means to be called. Where are you staying? Are you the Messiah? <coughs> are you the one promised of God from the time we came from Egypt? Are you the king who will lead us as Samuel did? Who are you? Jesus inviting them home to look around? You could say, well, sure he was. What kind of a Jesus would it be who wasn't, if he wasn't welcoming? But again, we go back to John the, the writer, John the theologian. What is John saying? Come and see. Not just look around. Come and see with the eyes of faith. Look at what is around you with the eyes of faith. Recognize that I am indeed the Messiah. Recognize that I am indeed Jesus who will die for you. Recognize that I am Jesus who redeemed you because I rose from the dead. Recognize who I am with the eyes of faith. That's what Jesus calls those disciples to. And guess what? He is calling we, or us disciples, whatever the English is, to be the same way. To see with the eyes of faith who Jesus is and what he is calling us to. Now how do you know that you are a disciple. Did you get checked in on the way in? With a stamp that said you are a disciple. Probably not. So how do we know that we are disciples? Are we the baptized? Say amen. amen. Oh good. For a minute there. If we are the baptized, then we are disciples. Amen? Amen? It's automatic. You cannot be baptized and not be a disciple. And think of what does that baptism mean. Earlier in the gospel, it says the heavens were torn apart. The Spirit descended from heaven and the Lord God said you are my beloved we are the baptized when we were baptized the heavens were torn apart thank God they left the roof Spirit descended, came into us, and we became, through our profession of faith, disciples of Jesus Christ. We were called in baptism to be disciples of Jesus. And now we are called every day to answer that call. Jesus is within us. The Spirit is within us. And what are we called to do as disciples? We are called to make sure that Jesus lives in our community. No one will know Jesus 
if the disciples don't speak Jesus to them. We are, by our baptism, called by Jesus. And the only question that remains is how will we answer that call? And I'm calling you, the Indian love call, will How do we make Jesus manifest in our world? You already do a wonderful job of that as a community. You know, there's a wonderful program that this church sponsors in which people come here who have no work and they get work by going out into the community. And they get the dignity of being paid. Not very much. But they get paid as human beings. What a wonderful gift you as a community are giving to the, the city in which we live, Grand Rapids. And there are many other programs that you have going on here. That's the community in action. What a wonderful gift. But as disciples, each of us is called to make Jesus present in our world. So if you're walking along Fulton here, or maybe you go down Division Street, and you run into one of our neighbors, and they're dressed a little bit to be draggled, and maybe they smell a little bit, and they say to you, you know, can you give me a buck? I need something to eat. And the police and many community leaders tell us, don't give them money. Dilemma. What are we to do? As Jesus did. We take them where they are and we give them food. Maybe we take them to a restaurant or to a coffee shop. Heaven knows there's plenty around there. We don't just pay for their food. We sit down with them and eat that food with them, helping them to realize that they are not just anybody, but somebody. And then they know somehow that Jesus is alive. Well, maybe we walk into a restaurant and we see one of our black brothers and sisters sitting all by themselves in one corner of the restaurant, surrounded by all of us folks who are white. Will we go over to them and sit down with them and chat? Welcome them. Say hello. Who do you think is going to win the game this afternoon? Will it be the pack or the hawk? We're celebrating Martin Luther King this weekend and what he did, not just for the black community, but for all of us, black and white, red, yellow, brown. What he was working for wasn't just for the black community. It was for all of us that we would recognize that we are all human beings, that regardless of the color of our skin, we are human and therefore need the, re the, 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 the love and the life that Jesus Christ can bring into our lives. That's what we are celebrating. And so you might say, wait a minute, Jesus didn't do that. Really? What about the time he spoke to the woman at the well? She was a Samaritan. She'd only been married seven times. Ooh. Good heavens. She wasn't Jewish. Holy Mac. And he was sitting, talking to her all by himself. You know, the apostles and disciples came along. Lord, I mean, come on. 
but she was a Samaritan. That was the problem. She wasn't one of us. Well, maybe you have a child who's 12 going on 20. And all of a sudden, the beautiful little girl is really a cop. She has her own way of doing things. And you recognize, I can't just be her pal. I've got to be her mom or dad. And you suddenly realize the teaching as Jesus did it, isn't quite so easy. Or someone whom you care about and for, particularly care for, who is older, but who also has a very stinging remark for practically anything you do. And yet you go on doing it. Because you are a disciple of Jesus. And you have heard him say, love one another as I have loved you. And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, this disciple stuff is not easy. And it isn't. And Jesus never promised us a rose garden either. But what Jesus did for us helped us to be better people. He raises us up as he was raised up. He helps us to understand what a loving God we have. That the same God who called out to Samuel calls out to us. And that the same God who walked the streets of Jerusalem and all around that area of the world, that same Jesus who died for us, even though we were sinners, he died for us because he loved us. He rose from the dead because the Lord God saw to it that he needed to be with us and for us. And in his resurrection, he gives us a new life that will never end. We know all that. Because we are disciples. Because we see with the eyes of faith. And because we act as Jesus would act in our every day And I'm calling you, will you answer, Thank you for being with us this Sunday morning. Every year when I get the programmatic calendar, I've gotten the programmatic calendar of the United Methodist Church for 35 years. And every year comes around the third Sunday of January and it's called on the calendar Ecumenical Sunday. I've never, well, I shouldn't say never, I have not done nearly enough in my pastoral tenure to proceed in building ecumenical relations. And when I heard Brother John on Good Friday, he connected with me in his message, and I knew we needed to have him come and share as a way to celebrate ecumenism. We need to be together in the Christian faith. We need to build on not what divides us, but what unites us. And so we are delighted to have him here. 
And now may God grace you with the power to recall what he has said to you and be instruments of grace and peace as disciples.